All right. Today is June the 27th and 2023. And my guest is Lawrence Iron. Lawrence is a steward at Witterdau, a community-owned collective dedicated to funding and advancing longevity science. Today, we're going to talk about why longevity is the defining question of the century, what holds it back, and how we can unleash the potential of the science and technology we have available. So Lawrence and I will, in this context, present some of the ideas we developed together around starting a longevity network state. So this is a very special episode. Lawrence and I have become friends a while ago and have been working together on some new plans that we're going to reveal for the first time in public in, in this episode. So if, if you want to join Lawrence and I for to exploring these ideas further and do something concrete and a hint, we're going to go to new places, to special jurisdictions in Latin America, Montenegro, potentially in Africa, to advance biotech and longevity technology uh, and science, build new companies, and push the frontiers for humanity. So you can sign up there to receive updates, no commitment required yet. That's just as a hint. Now, without further ado, Lawrence, welcome to the show, finally. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, pleasure and honor to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. Thanks. Great. Lawrence, what is your background and what role does health play in your life? Hmm. So, indeed, um, initially, I health was the most important thing to me because um, growing up, I've spent a lot of time in hospitals. I've had many surgeries. Um, and so I know what it's like to feel frail, like old people. Um, so that's the main reason I'm working on uh, aging and longevity today. Um, I wanted to become a doctor, but the white coat wasn't really for me. I was really good at science. I wasn't so good at clinical, you know, the talking to people aspect. Um, I did love doing practical things, um, and things that I could do by myself without other people. So that was, you know, computers, uh, creating my own video games, uh, and all kinds of tools, tech uh, applications. But then I went into entrepreneurship. I realized I need to make something that people actually want. So the programming isn't enough. The technological part isn't enough. So I, I did a lot of uh, tech startups um, and then went into investing, uh, had some sabbatical, some time to think, uh, learn and so on. Um, always the goal has been to improve the, the human condition. And I love problem solving and so on. I spent some time towards um, AGI, AI safety, brain machine interfaces thinking about all these things, but um, really worried about existential risks. I really love life. Um, I don't think I'd really want to die as long as I'm healthy. I don't want uh, life itself to die. Um, so really, I think um, serving life is, is my main driver. And I realized that a lot of the existential risks are not likely to kill us within our lifetime, but aging itself. It's basically a hundred percent going to make us suffer and die. When when that when aging wouldn't be the the biggest problem anymore, I definitely go on to make humanity more resilient to other risks, uh, global, galactic, whatever catastrophes. But for now, in the next few decades, seems like we really need longevity biotech keep us healthy for longer until we reach that next inflection point. And so I see the bottleneck in the field as this diversity of startups and speed of innovation, the amount of research, the cost of research, but then more and more so uh, the human coordination and the, the, the roadblocks other humans put into, put to humans. So that's it, regulation. So with VitaDAO, um, what we can do is um, coordinate a large number of people to accelerate the research, uh, the aging research into startups that otherwise wouldn't exist, can bring that diversity, that scalable, democratic participation 
Uh-huh. We're going to get to deep dive a bit more in VitaDAO later. But before, I want to hear a bit more about your journey, Lawrence. You're originally from Romania, right? But yeah. you travel a lot, right? So how do you live right now? And how and when did you get to travel and live in different places? Mm, when I was uh, 16, 17, I um, participated in an um, international competition by Google. It was a grand prize winner. They invited me to Silicon Valley. I fell in love. And um, around eight, when I was not 18, 19, I started going there, fundraising for my tech startups, uh, spending a few months a year, then kind of half, half my time, and um, then going to other places as well to diversify. Uh, before I sort of get married to a place, I said, yeah, Silicon Valley seems the best, San Francisco seems the best, but before I get married to it, let me explore a little bit, date around a little bit. <laughs> and I haven't really, I've seen the issues with San Francisco Bay Area, and I haven't really found another place with the huge density of really smart people, but also people that are visionaries and actually execute. So I've kind of ended up traveling a lot. I actually don't like traveling. Um, It's just kind of, I need to go certain places and meet certain people, make stuff happen. And that's why also I'm super excited about uh, creating these new cities, new special jurisdictions, pop-up cities like Suzalo. We're going to talk about a lot more. Just bringing the kinds of amazing people I want to be around together in, in various locations and more and more people. And then as we are a community of people, then why would, uh, why would others outside of our community tell us what we can and cannot do? But rather, let's make our own uh, laws and regulations, right? Let's let's have our own governance as we are a huge community that are bigger than a city, right? Yeah, I feel like when when we got to know each other and the community we built in Suzalu, we were kind of starting a nomadic tribe, right? And yeah. Potentially going together to more different places as a tribe in the future. Um, Lawrence, if I'm not mistaken, weren't you at Y Combinator in 2014 when Balaji <laughs> gave his first talk about network states? Well, or about yeah. his vision, what was that like, and what did you what do you remember from it? Oh, uh, well, the the whole startup school um, there. So I went to a bunch of the in person startup schools, even the one at Stanford with Sam Altman and and met Peter Thiel there. Uh, yeah, met, met Balaji at that uh, Wake Under startup school. I think it might have been 2013, but I'm not sure exactly. My memory is quite. Uh, quite fuzzy there. He was calling them cloud nations, uh, I think. And uh, yeah, really amazing discussions. We were discussing quantum computing and fusion and starting new cloud countries. And all of that was like, whoa, Jesus, amazing. But I was, uh, I was kind of focused on um, uh, helping um, people socialize, um, meet people in real life, using technology to help us interact in face-to-face instead of it taking us away from that, especially with dating. Um, we didn't have Tinder back then, but it, it was really a turnoff for me, online dating. So I was focusing a lot on, on the social aspects. And then more and more later, I realized, oh, remember, I, I started um, having these uh, aches and pains uh, more and more like an old person. And so I really... Uh, started spending a lot of time on my own personal health and longevity. And then the more I learned about nutrition and lifestyle interventions, the, the less I knew. And the more disappointed I was in, in science and biology, uh, we're not really following the scientific method. We're not really investing in the right things. And so I discovered um, the, that progress is way slower than I anticipated, especially in, in this new approach to medicine, which tries to bring aging under medical control. And so I decided to change my career. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's... Now enter VitaDAO. What was actually the founding history of VitaDAO and at what point did you enter and wh- when does your history at VitaDAO begin? I think it also starts with, with my love for tech because I, I loved the name Bitcoin when I first heard of it, uh, the first year of college, like 2013. And um, I mined it on my laptop and then kind of got too expensive, too frothy for me, it went out of it. Then I saw Ethereum, okay, we can actually program things, we can do a lot more, got into that, won a hackathon there. 
it was kind of a parallel track in my career and also kind of merged with my investing as well later on when I actually had some money. And then um, I really at Burning Man, actually, another huge gathering, like a, like one of these pop-up cities, right, where uh, we have 80,000 people gather, build a city, hang out for about a week and, and then leave no trace. Um, there I uh, met Griff Green, starting DAOs for public goods and, and uh, better coordination and creating microeconomies to have impact in things that communities care about. And I was like, whoa, I mean, I care about longevity. Most people don't for some reason, but it seems like crypto actually really cares. About, like the crypto people, the top European leaders there seem to be aligned with longevity, which was surprising to me, but I think it kind of makes sense. There's both communities are are dismissed by the incumbents, therefore thinking in finance, respectively medicine. And so I thought, yeah, amazing, let's let's unite the two things. Uh, Alex Dobrin and myself were both stewards in VitaDAO, but before VitaDAO existed, we were starting a longevity DAO, which had a bit of a different model, way too complex for, for most longevity people to understand with token bonding curves and so on. But then we saw the, we kind of had some interactions with um, with Molecule, the people from Molecule that created this framework of IP NFTs using non-fungible tokens to represent IP rights on the blockchain. And we, and we saw that and we said, okay, this is amazing because it actually gives a community actual assets in the real world. So we, VitaDAO, are the first sort of decentralized autonomous organization to fund real world research and hold real world assets in terms of uh, intellectual property on chain. Great. So how does you, the, the business model for VitaDAO look like, right? So I'm assuming some of the listeners are already familiar with it a bit, right? So you're basically funding early stage science and research that's otherwise not getting funding, right? How does that look in practice? How big are grants typically and who gets them and what happens to these projects afterwards typically? Or also maybe if you could talk a bit about, um, why or which projects don't get funding in the mainstream science world? Yeah, and indeed there's a huge translational value of death. There's a lot of um, basic research that you have academics kind of writing papers, looking at some older existing off and drugs and how they impact aging in various model organisms like worms and mice and so on. And, and then it kind of, uh, they write the paper and it sits there, but, um, those can be really mined to, to build intellectual property, but there is no incentive to do that. It's too early for pharma and traditional VC, and it's too non-academic for <laughs> grants from the government. And so there's just that huge value of that. And so there is a lot of, um, interesting assets sitting on the shelves of universities, not getting translated. So we're working with uh, applicants um, to incubate those ideas, which are indeed kind of too academic, too much geared to write papers and too little sort of commercializable sort of things that can actually be become valuable IP. And so we're, we're incubating those things and then funding them. Uh, once the experimental plan is building something valuable, and then once it's de-risked and you, you do that killer, killer experiment, then it would be ready for it to be spun out into a company. And we're doing three spin-outs uh, this year. Um, and some are actual companies which can raise money from VCs, but some don't necessarily need to be companies. So we just had last week the first IP NFT uh, tokenization slash fractionalization. So basically being able to not only have uh, co a community owned tokens in, in all of VitaDAO governing the whole um, organization with all of its assets, uh, which we have about 19, 20, 20 things that we funded um, in the past two years since we started uh, almost exactly two years, by the way, uh, happy anniversary. And uh, so instead of governing all of these, you can also pick, we did Korolchuk, which is the second IP NFT. Uh, it's a project, uh, Korolchuk lab at the Newcastle University. 
discovering novel autophagy uh, inducers, um, small molecules. We had some amazing hits and, and basically you can buy these uh, governance tokens called VitaFast, uh, fast from fasting because autophagy, you know, it's, it's uh, really induced by fasting as well. So these molecules, you wouldn't need to fast anymore. Ideally, you, you would take this drug and mimic the, the effects of fasting and, and increase your healthy longevity, ideally. And with these tokens, you govern the research in that specific project, how it progresses, how it's uh, licensed, how it gets uh, potentially sold to, to other companies or, or spin outs or, or things like that. And so we had a 16x oversubscribed, like, so it was like 16 or 17,000, 1700% oversubscribed in, in the uh, crowd sale. And um, yeah, we kind of gave it to only members of VitaDAO, gave the opportunity to buy these uh, these fractions and um, at, at the, the, basically the cost that we funded the research. But anyway, so what you're describing, there's kind of a gap in the market, right? So there's tons of science, tons of academia, and there is tons of commercialization as well, but not enough, right? So there's tons of science. There's kind of a gap between sort of science that's available and sort of practical implementation. And it needs um, both researchers, scientists, and entrepreneurs to pick those up to make them ready to de-risk them so they can be commercialized, which requires more studies, I suppose, more research, right? And more IP building. Yep. And VitaDAO is kind of funding that, which sounds to me a bit like angel um, investing stage, mm -hmm. right? So 50 to 100K maybe, is that right? Oh, yes. So in, in terms of the, the, the check size you asked, um, it, it is a default check about 250K. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, funded um, also existing startups uh, through our community with up to a million, but we also... Mm -hmm to smaller amounts like 50K and so on. Depends on, on what uh, the needs are and uh, the available um, treasury amount. So right now we have about 6 million liquid. We deployed about 4 million last time I looked. And um, we had the um, initial auction when we launched two years ago with 5.1 million. And, you know, everyone could, it was a fair auction, everyone could bid on the tokens. There was no pre-sale, there were no VCs or anything like that, just people uh, buying tokens. And um, about a few months ago, we also had a, a sale to uh, strategic contributors, um, pharma, like Pfizer, crypto VCs like Shine and and. and um, L1D, L1 Digital, and also individuals like Balaji, longevity startups like Retro, and DAO is like Beaker DAO. Um, so we're kind of moving more and more towards um, being recognized by by the industry as yeah. legitimate, which is pretty hard. You know, you're a uh, crypto weird sort of organization, new type of organization with this token. And, and, and now I think we're really seen as this company builder with amazing assets, novel ways of fundraising, like with this uh, VitaFast token, right? We now have actual liquid early stage science and IP where there's a liquid market around it. That's, that's novel. That's the first in, uh, in the world. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the science of longevity, right? So there's a fantastic episode, by the way, for listeners, episode 45 with Patrick Linden, who talks about the ethics of longevity with the moral premise that life is good and death is bad. So that's kind of the premise for our conversation. We think we've clarified the moral questions. And um, if you disagree, then check out that episode. And you can still disagree if you want to, of course. But the idea is that life is good. We want more of it. If you had the chance to increase it from 40 to 60, would you do it? Yes. 60 to 80. Yes. So why stop there? All right. So, and Patrick is talking about many of these arguments in the book. Let's talk about the science. What makes us actually think 
that we can significantly, potentially radically and increase human healthy lifespan? So we have uh, about 30 years of geoscience research. Geoscience is this field of, of uh, studying aging and the um, translational aspects of, of bringing longevity therapeutics to market. Um, so from this research, a few decades of research, we've identified uh, around 10 molecular causes of aging and they've, they've stayed pretty um, we haven't really been surprised in the past decade or two by anything too novel or crazy. So I think we're, we're at the, at the good stage where a lot more money in the translational aspect would help to actually make the therapies, the drugs. Uh, we don't have anything that works in humans yet, but there's a bunch of things in, in clinical trials. They're, they're quite old, of course, uh, the kinds of therapies that are now in humans, uh, in human trials, because again, it takes a long time. There is a huge regulatory burden. Um, so the idea is that you're targeting the, the root cause of all these age related diseases. Everyone agrees that we don't like cancer. We don't like heart disease, Alzheimer's and so on. And there's a sort of um, vicious cycle that these diseases of aging drive these patient groups and the pharma lobby to petition the elected officials to allocate resources to work on these diseases of aging. Um, even though the problem is aging itself, which is driving all of these diseases. When you look at the, the curves, they, the risk to get uh, all of these goes up exponentially with age. For example, um, if you smoke, everyone else, okay, okay, you smoke, you increase your chances of cancer, maybe 10x. Um, but if you age from 20 to 70, you increase your chances of cancer a thousand X. Um, aging is much worse than, than smoking to, <laughs> for you. Um, but then you have these agency mandates that limit research to diseases. If you're trying to research aging, you're not, you cannot get grants easily. Um, the NIA, National Institute of Aging, um, allocates about 80% of its budget to Alzheimer's. And then the remaining 20%, most of that is for, you know, social aspects of aging, like you know, park benches and how we can respect the elderly and all of those issues. And very, very little to the biology of aging itself. Um, and I think... People don't really want to confront aging and death, including the, the funding allocators, the decision makers. Uh, most people don't have a will. They, they don't really, they, there's a understandable coping mechanism um, that I'm sure Patrick Linden has talked about, um, where you just don't, are afraid to hope that we can do anything about it. There's all these stories that we've been told, right? Uh, if you look for the fountain of youth, there's some, some, bad thing that's going to happen. Uh, we had this also with flying, Icarus, right? The, uh, if, if he flew too close to the sun, got its wings, uh, his wings burnt and fell to the ground. Um, so you shouldn't attempt flying. Well, guess what? We're flying every day now. Um, and I think drugs that target aging are the future of medicine. Um, and it's really, we, I think we have to take this approach because otherwise it's economically unsustainable. We're keeping with, with treat, we're just treating the symptoms, the, the effects instead of the root cause, the symptoms of these diseases. We're keeping people in a poor state of health for longer. So we need more Medicare, more sick care, more elderly uh, asylums, right? And all these nurses and so on to, to take care of those. And, and then, so they're taking away from society. It cannot be healthy and contribute to society. And then we also have very little, very few kids. And most kids are in the developing nations. We already have more people over 65 than people under five. And so you're going to, in the rich countries, you're now lucky to have some immigration, but even so, the population is decreasing and, and you have this inverted pyramid, which is getting worse and worse, and it's just going to collapse. Uh, you, you have just way too many elderly people on, for each person um, that is of working age at least in the, in the next few decades, 
I think this is really going to bottleneck society as a whole. It's going to, it's, people are going to try to run, uh, you know, run around, try to find nurses to take care of their, their aging parents. It's, it's pretty grim what's, what seems to be coming up. So we really need a new approach. Yeah. We're aging societies. We don't have good demographics. We don't have enough productive people to carry kind of the financial, um, burden to care for future generations, for elderly, for our medical, for our healthcare systems, right? So it's on younger people yeah. or on people just staying more productive for a longer amount of time. So we already know that several of sort of the welfare states in European or the United countries or the United States are under strong pressure and there's escalating and increasing costs. And what's really important about what we're talking about is there is very good reason to believe that aging, which is sort of a potentially or very likely a cause for other diseases, is its potential. We have potential to slow it down much more than we um, that we do now, and potentially even reverse it. Right. So there's been a very strong science for more than thirty years with Nobel prizes being awarded with very clear yeah. consensus around certain factors, Yamanaka factors, hallmarks of aging, sort of the molecular biology of aging and of cell degeneration. So you can call it consensus that these are sort of the biochemical reasons why we age. And there is potential, there are engineering challenges around sort of slowing it down more significantly than we do now, develop drugs around it and therapies, potentially even reverse it. And this is kind of the challenge we're faced with right now. So we need to fund or do more of that translational, how do we go from the science we have to solving engineering challenges to keep it in the human body, right? So, you know, keep it in the cells, develop proteins, drugs um, that sort of have long-term effects, right? That's kind of the missing or the gap. And under the current scientific um, and science funding um, paradigm and of the current sort of medical innovation paradigm, that is too slow, right? And one reason is that aging is not recognized as a disease, right? So it's very hard to get science funding for it that's exploring sort of these engineering challenges. And then second, and that's what I'd like to spend some more time talking about, um, that the regulatory paradigm. So what makes us decide, how do we decide which of those things do we bring to market, right? So how do we get it from the science, from the technology into the market, into drugs and therapies that people can buy over the counter and pharmacies, treatments they get from their doctors and things like that. So uh, I know Lawrence, and, Lawrence, you and I, we have history of exploring this question together, right? So this podcast was for me an exploration in sort of uncovering some of the reasons why we do so badly and developing solutions. And um, you've been following it. We've had many discussions around that. So how would you summarize your current state of, how do would you right now encapsulate your analysis of the problem of the regulatory paradigm? And what are, what's kind of the solution space that, um, that, you're, that you're interested in right now to explore? Right. So on the one side, in terms of uh, feasibility, we've shown uh, with dozens of pharmaceutical interventions that aging can be reversed by or slowed down by 30% in, in various animal models. Um, and, and then one problem there, of course, is that the animal models of disease are kind of unrealistic when it's cost, especially when it comes to these chronic diseases of aging. Um, which are quite complex and multifactorial, but it seems to aging, it seems that aging is quite conserved, um, across like literally everything that we test, like a good molecule that slows down aging and, and extends healthy lifespan in, in, uh, one organism seems to extend it in literally everything, like from worms to mice, to monkeys, to, uh, everything. So I'm quite optimistic there. Um. Now, when it comes to translating that, I think the big, 
the biggest issue is um, that we don't have a will in, in terms of uh, top-down funding and coordination. So we, I think the best is bottom-up um, through a community of people that could potentially gather also in, in real life and have uh, real estate. They can um, have their own governance structure and decide the rules they play by. And the will of the people cannot be questioned by authoritarian urges and in this in this prevailing prohibitory paternalistic paradigm that we have regulations uh, medical regulations in right now um i think so there's a very strong ethics look, component right so what we often point at is the work of Jessica Flanagan from Pharmaceutical Freedom or just simply the movie Dallas Buyers Club, right? So you use the word authoritarian and paternalistic, which is correct in my opinion, right? So you are barred from making decisions that affect your own body. If someone else yes. thinks it's risky for you, even if you say, hey, I know the risks, but I still want to do it, you're often not allowed to, or the system is very strongly prohibitive or trying to prevent you, if, even if you're a scientist, even if you're a doctor, from, from doing these things. Yeah, and, and it's understandable. I think um, in regula regulators are smart, they're ambitious people, but their incentives are skewed. Uh, their incentives to increase the power of the agency to have this um, higher, bigger and bigger scope. And type one and type two error, which... Um, you know, type one error is, of course, if you approve a medicine that hurts people, uh, that's bad, but it, there's a self-corrective mechanism there. Um, but that's like the worst nightmare of a regulator. Nobody wants to hurt people, approve things that hurt people. But then type two, of course, is um, not approving a drug that would save a lot of people. And there's an invisible grave graveyard there. Um, and it's understandable like, if, if regulators approve and make mistakes, people blame them. If a company experiments on people too early and kills people, um, it's bad for them. So not only regulators, actually, but also companies kind of have an incentive to be more, more uh, conservative. But uh, if people want to take a risk, um, you know, if people want to climb Everest, by, then they can just do it by themselves, right? Like nobody's stopping them. If if people want to get into a bad relationship, uh, get married to the wrong person, the government isn't stopping you from making those risky choices or refusing medicine. We have a really good uh, treaty or understanding or, or agreement, uh, the Helsinki agreement, right? And it, this idea of informed consent, we cannot force medicine onto people if, if they have to, to be informed and to consent. And... Yeah, just dis disagree. They if they want to, you know, eat fruits and juice and, instead of uh, chemotherapy, they're allowed to take that risk, but they're not allowed to take the opposite risk, right? So I think if if you have a, a community of biohackers um, with potentially, of course, a lot of like, instead of prohibitory, but rather like having a certificatory approach, you have the FDA and similar agencies and private insurance companies and all kinds of groups like consumer reports and so on, putting up star ratings of, of various medicines and people look at that and say, okay, I want to take the five star where, you know, I'm desperate because I'm going to die soon anyway. So I'm going to take even the one star medicine. Um, you know, why, like, why uh, you, you've mentioned uh, Dallas Virus Club, right? Where, why prevent people from taking an HIV medicine that might harm them if they're going to die anyway, right? Um, especially if it's approved in other places of the world, right? Like, um, wh what was the, um, and yeah, NCT, and I think was the name of, of it, right? Where yeah, I think Israel, was... France, Japan, Mexico, several people had uh, drugs available for HIV patients that were extending and saving their lives. And the FDA allowed it only seven years later. Yeah. And there's kind of a smoking gun moment because they had this press release where they said that decision is now saving 10,000 people per year. And of course, if you uh, think for a second, well, that means the seven years before when you didn't admit it, 70,000 people 
died because they didn't have access to this drug, right? Because you were too slow to approve it. And that's only just one example with a smoking gun, right? So the F there's numerous examples in the history of the FDA. Some are more known, some are less known. Um, just because the invisible graveyard is kind of this abstract thing, right? So for example, Raymond March talked about uh, better insulin treatments that took the FDA 30 years to approve, but they affect like one in nine people that could get cheaper and better insulin treatments for diabetes, right? Yeah, so human insulin instead of, yeah, like it, instead of taking animal insulin, which had like um, bad side effects, 30 years took them so to that. So it's, it's like millions of life years lost. I mean, yeah, it's just hard think... to fathom sometimes when you think about that. And honestly, I don't know about you, Lawrence, because you're even deeper in this than I am, but sometimes... I just have these dialogues in my head for all the things that are wrong with the status quo, right? And I just think all the time, how do I convince people just to see it, right? And to just like, come on, you can't seriously believe that this is the right way to do things. There's so many people falling through the cracks. There's so many people suffering because there's like no operation warp speed for them. And they have to fight or go through like a Kafkaesque and Byzantine medical system to, you know, to, to, and you have to navigate that when they're not doing well, right? Which is often the hardest part of it. And many of us were young, right? So I didn't have the same experience that you have. Like we're not that aware of it because it doesn't affect us yet. It comes when we're older. Now I'm seeing my parents, my dad struggle with health issues and it's very hard for him to navigate that system and it's not there for him. Yeah, I think everyone agrees uh, in the abstract uh, idea that health is the most important thing, but until you lose it, you don't fully, fully really, uh, grasp that idea. You're not fully present to this idea. Um, so I, I was in a way unlucky and in a way lucky to, to be present with these issues. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess why, uh, even though I'm young, I'm thinking about the, de the inevitable decline that will come with. With age, most people just put it out there, out of their mind. And I think intrinsic motivation matters a lot. I am, of course, a lot of times frustrated, like, oh my God, how are people not seeing that this is a better way to, to approach medicine, right? Target aging instead of each age related disease separately, instead of trying to cut the heads of the hydra, drive a stake through its heart and, and so on. But then also how are people not seeing that the FDA is, um, it's not structured properly. Um, that the, it, it's this, um, the system, this institution and a lot of institutions like this, right? Where the individual people are well-intentioned, well-meaning, great people, but then they, because of the incentives and, and this gestalt that, that emerges, things are, are, are <laughs> quite suboptimal. And I think. There is a, I, I would, I, I admire people that uh, try to change people's minds, especially, um, there's two ways you can have smart words, smart arguments, or you can show, not tell, tell stories, uh, make movies, make music. I definitely think the the latter is, is better. Um, Hollywood is, is great for, for changing people's hearts. Um, so that there's efforts on, on that side that I'm contributing to as well my sister as a, as an actor and actress and, and producer as well. But, um, also instead of trying to convince and lobby the government and convince people and so on, I think there's also an important hedge, which we're going to probably spend most time talking about, which is, okay, let's do it in a sandbox. Let's try it separately. And then I am sure the rest of the world will see how much more innovation, um, that can happen that yes, it can also be safe. We're not talking about, you know, what the wild west, where, you know, things are not safe. We're talking, um, just a slight difference in, in individual liberties where it's, people are not going to be crazy to inject themselves to, with all kinds of things, um, with, without any regulation, like you're going to have, uh, just better ways with insurance companies, uh, providing, um, some checks and balances with. Uh, star ratings where people you know, can choose to take the risk, but most people will definitely take the, the safest things available, uh, but just things will move a lot faster. Um, and then see those things and then 
implement it in the rest of the world. Once once it's done in a in a small sandbox, in a special jurisdiction or a small canton or state or something, then the rest of the world can can understand. And yeah, there is no warp speed, as you said, for Alzheimer's, even though it's a much bigger issue than uh, than COVID. And uh, for, for a lot of the chronic diseases of aging, uh, we have seen that you can get a, a lot of the regulation out of the way and kind of makes you think, why was it there in the first place? Why did it take 15 years to make a vaccine when we can do it in months? Um, and because there was a crisis, right? And people could see the potential invisible graveyard and they thought, okay, it's worth the risk, right? Um, but exactly. So yeah, that's where we're at right now, sort of regulatory sandboxes and we having, and that's partly also what the podcast is there for, you know, very nuanced debates. How could it look like to do it better, right? It's not the wild west. We want to do something like a certificatory system instead of prohibitive. Right. So we strongly, we want to work with insurances to certify what's definitely safe and what sort of different degrees of it hasn't been tested that properly. So at that stage, you should take it at your own risk. And the doctor kind of has to sort of um, provide informed consent around that. And also a regulatory approach would be more like after the fact, right? And have be stronger on sort of the liability side instead of the preventative side, right? So I talked with Neil Chilson on another episode who worked for the FTC, which is a more after the fact regulator, which is better, right? So you don't want to put all these barriers in place. You want to say after, if something goes wrong, there is like harsh punishments for fraud, for example. And this also creates a disincentive and creates clarity for any actor in the system. Well, if they don't follow what um, these kind of protocols when it comes to informed consent, or um, sort of if they don't follow these protocols that have been set up to clarify liability, there's very harsh punishments for that, right? So the regulatory approach that we're suggesting and we're working on, we want to optimize it for be, to be even safer, <laughs> while of course speeding things up that we want to work on, right? So what we want to work on is regulatory sandboxes where we can show this works and where we can innovate faster. So Lawrence, we talked a lot during Zuzalu. We had several events going on. We were looking into special jurisdictions for medical innovation. What have you learned during Zuzalu and where has that taken you? And what are kind of the initiatives you're working on right now to realize these sandboxes? So one thing was um, how open-minded, smart, young, sort of new leadership in Montenegro um, is so we just had the elections about a week ago. Uh, they, it was after Zuzalu, but I, I was I was there cheering for them and talking to a lot of the locals, and uh, we we made this um, one page proposal for the cabinet to uh, be excited about this potential special economic zone or jurisdiction. For, for or context, um, if listeners that haven't gotten that yet, so Zuzalu was a two month long pop-up city, pop-up village experiment organized or um, put into life by Vitalik Buderin. And it took place in Montenegro, right? And in Montenegro, there's new a new political party that came to power that we've had the possibility to interact with during Zuzalu and influence on some of our ideas when it comes to crypto and longevity, just for background. Yeah, so was, I'm very optimistic seeing how open-minded uh, they are, they understand the holy things, they understand crypto, they understand this better approach to medicine called longevity. Um, they want to declare aging a disease. Um, they're open to uh, establishing special economic zones, um, sort of a permanent Zuzalu with, with um, some regulatory autonomy on the, on the medical side and just providing um, the sort of world-class medical treatment and innovation uh, in a country that is definitely struggling with, with their healthcare system and, and so, sort of like being in symbiosis with the locals, having a great hospital, having uh, amazing medical tourists. Uh, so like tourism is the biggest industry for Montenegro. So uh, the, on, on the Montenegro side, there, there, there's a lot to, to dive in, into, but uh, given the, the limit on time, I think Another thing that I've, 
I've learned is, um, well, so first of all, don't just try to, um, make an online community and, and wait a long time until you crowdfund territory in, in real life. You don't need sovereignty. You don't need the network state. I think BetaDAO has shown that it is a network union, right? It's, it's a community that's online and it's highly aligned. Uh, we're on one moral innovation that, that, uh, we, we don't want to die from aging, that longevity is a better approach and so on. We've shown that we can act in a decentralized way. We're using this token, right? We vote on what projects we fund and incubate and spin out into companies and, and all of that. We have this, uh, this sustainable loop of like recycling the proceeds into the treasury, having more impact and, and all of this. I think it, it, that's really, um, solid. And then it, this idea of like eventually, um, having crowdfunding territory around the world, I think will take a, a long time. Um, I think it's also important to have the combined with the older ideas of creating charter cities or seasteading or all of these things. I think seasteading is less of a priority, uh, rather special economic zones in just like Prospera, which I'm sure you've talked a lot about, uh, indeed having a potential longevity district there, then a Montenegro uh, or Uruguay, Costa Rica, Panama, Belize, and, and so on, a bunch of Latin American places, then, you know, Africa, Zanzibar, Mauritius, Ghana, Kenya, all, all these super open-minded places and, and potentially Georgia and Northern Cyprus and in, in Europe. I don't know about Dubai and Singapore. I haven't really talked to the leaders there yet. Uh, so like Asia, maybe. Palau is also really great, but it's, it's, it's very far away from everything. Uh, so like we kind of have good, uh, good op opportunities in, in various places in the world. Um, when it comes to North America, maybe some Indian reservations, but probably they don't have enough autonomy for, for this. Uh, but so, so what I've learned a lot is, is like, have an archipelago. Don't try to only go in one location, um, that you have more leverage in terms of negotiations when you have a lot of options uh, with these governments, but then also that you don't need only places where you have the regulatory autonomy. Look at also a small U.S. state, a small Swiss canton. So we have vitalism.io with my friends Adam Gries and Nathan Chang trying to, to establish a longevity state, an existing uh, rich place where people can gather and have, just like at Zuzulu, have a bunch of, have a longevity neighborhood with uh, healthy food available, with people interacting in real life and doing the same habits that we've done at Zuzu Lorraine, like cold lunges, saunas, uh, all kinds of exercises and classes. It, it's much easier for me to go swim and exercise and so on if, if I have other people around me doing it. Otherwise, I'm just like on my laptop working all day. Um, then of course, other healthy habits. And then of course, the it's very hard to to eat healthy by yourself, especially when you're in a city with amazing food restaurants, but but they're not healthy. So in, in Zuzelo, we had a, uh, one of the restaurants with our own menu and chef and, and super healthy, uh, food designed, uh, based on Brian Johnson's, uh, blueprint. And so if you, if you have that in a, an existing state, a neighborhood where a lot of uh, health minded people join and, and understand these things, and then you add incentives for biotech, you make a sort of Silicon Valley of longevity in, in something like Rhode Island in the U S for example, very close to Boston, quite doable. Then once you have a lot of people, you can get also some political power and, and, uh, make research institutes and, uh, pro provide a lot more funding than these poorer countries can. Uh, but you probably don't have regulatory autonomy there. You still have the federal sort of agencies like FDA, um, not allowing people to inject themselves with whatever uh, they want. So, um. You know, it's definitely um, yeah. more diversity. That's that's uh, one of the key things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's some of the direction that we want to go in together in the future as well. And just to make that a bit more clear or tangible, like it's in some way not that different from what multinational companies or even not too big tech startups are doing. 
right? So they're going into different jurisdictions for different kinds of advantages. Even startups with like a couple of hundreds of people might have three different jurisdictions, right? So they're arbitraging reg uh, regulations around labor, around taxes, availability of talent, availability of other sort of infrastructure. So maybe if you're like in tech, you want to have like chips manufacturing, that's close or wherever, right? So multinational companies are already doing that. That's um, not, and also in the special jurisdiction space through like competitive governance, there's now kind of a bit of network effects around pushing governments or sort of making the idea more scalable to get sort of regulatory exemptions or sandboxes. Right. So this makes it especially interesting for frontier technologies, right? The kind of space that we're in. So I think what we're doing has tremendous potential really to show to frontier areas, to, to people who work on frontier technologies, Hey, it's doable, right? Other people are doing it and, you know, multinational companies, startups have been doing it all the time. It's totally fine to diversify kind of your business strategy and go to different places and sort of lobby or try to get the advantages that you need to make your moral innovation work. Sort of what we're trying to do for longevity, right? So Lawrence, how could, how would your ideal future look like for that longevity network states? Can you kind of try to paint a picture of how, how it could look like and how many different places would it be and how would they look like? Yeah, so I'm not sure about the state part, but definitely this online community, just like Vidadao, becoming bigger and bigger, right? Having millions of people online. Most people are not going to be able to... Getting too to, used be... to use the word network state. <laughs> I also don't like it that much. We like network union, network nation, startup society. We like that better. Maybe I should <laughs> renew from Balaji there as well. Right. We, we don't have yet the, the best namings, right? When we talk about uh, jurisdictions, also people are like, oh, that's boring legal stuff. Uh, so it's it's pretty uh, pretty hard to, to talk about it, but um, you know that's uh, that's at the begin that's what happens at the beginning. Um, yeah, I think millions of people online that are interested in all of this potentially um, participating in the centralized clinical trials, and then for the more uh, le leading leading age edge stuff um, where you need people coming together in, in very, um, very complex things to manufacture and give to people to uh, try, you, you do need, I think, some regulatory innovation there. Um, so ideally, because this is for us life and death, a lot of people, I think, from that big online community would be willing to move to these special jurisdictions that ideally we wouldn't have just one, we'd have multiple. Um, and if there's some issue with one, we could have relocation insurance and basically be able to easily move to another one. Um, and then we would be able to uh, have this uh, star rating uh, system and potentially multiple competing certificatory agencies and still potentially look at punishing fraudulent claims aggressively. I think most supplements nowadays have a lot of noise for people just mostly tune out all the bullshit anti-aging claims and so on, which obviously nobody's getting younger uh, yet. Um, people don't believe it anyway. Uh, but maybe, you know, we, once you have um, some star rating agency like Consumer Reports for, for medicine, Maybe people will stop uh, believing the, the supplements uh, labels and only believe what what these agencies would say, and 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 therefore it'll be better. Of course, I am worried about uh, scammy things, but we have a lot of that already with uh, um, you know the creams and all that. Um, I think if if we have these jurisdictions, we have this online community. Um, that the world will start learning. They will see, okay, these guys are innovating. There's some stuff that seems to work. They are doing a great job scientifically, statistically, uh, proving that this stuff works. And then, um, investors will see those therapies as de-risked and invest, uh, instead of a one in 10 chance or one in five or so on, 
uh, for this drug from phase one to get to phase three or, or to approval through the FDA. They'd be like, okay, it's been proven in this sandbox um, instead of a 10 to 20% chance of it passing through all these hoops. And now it's like 90 plus percent yeah, discounting, you know, assuming that they don't fully believe. But that will basically make it way more investable. So then it, and then you can also justify warp speed. You can say, look, those people over there are curing Alzheimer's and, and heart disease. Like they're re literally coming back with their arteries uh, cleaned up of all that plaque. They're coming back with the, you know, with elastic arteries and all that. So you can say, this is like COVID. This is a crisis. People are, my, my parents are dying. They're waiting in these clinical trials. Um, they're taking 10 years and so on. And you got to do it. You know, look at those guys. They've done it. They're amazing. Let's do it here too. And then so the whole, just like this infectious thing of like the whole world just moving to a better regulatory uh, paradigm, uh, taking months and millions of dollars instead of 15 years and billions of dollars for, for HPV therapy, moving to uh, s smarter, like novel therapies, like gene and cell therapies, instead of just small molecules, which you know, they're just uh, pretty much all the low hanging fruit are, I think, taken. Um, and then just the whole world waking up, like in the fable of the dragon tyrant and realizing, damn, like I might be on the, the last train going to the graveyard, basically. Um, or, you know, if, if only we started the day earlier, my father wouldn't have died because we invented this medicine, um, a day later, um, or, you know, just even if, yeah, in, we improve because there's 110,000 people dying every day, 40 million or so dying every year from aging. Um, that's about one life every second. So just even like a little bit of speeding up would save so many more lives than, than any sort of uh, risk that uh, we're taking in, in approving things that might be a bit harmful. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a dream. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I'm kind of thinking almost of like a fountain of youth or <laughs> almost like a refuge for when you're desperate, right? When there's no treatments that work for you, there's still this place that you can go to and you've heard about it. It's kind of a bit notorious, a bit edgy, but mm -hmm. then you do it and you go there and people are like really nice and doctors are really caring and they're talking you through different options and that you that aren't accessible otherwise. And then you come back from it and you just feel rejuvenated just mm -hmm. from the um, just from the experience of like seeing the future of human health and potentially <laughs> also be healed in the process. That's kind yeah. of, I think, an ultimate experience yeah. to create, right? A lot of people have said that they feel rejuvenated and, mm -hmm. and sort of mind blown and life, like their life has changed just by coming for two months to Montenegro to Zuzalu, right? Zuzalu and and hanging out that. with, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. hanging out with, uh, with these amazing people, having the density of smart people that's probably higher than San Francisco, higher than everywhere with, um, with better regulations, better laws, um, such that you're not gridlocked like in San Francisco. I mean, in San Francisco, there's just, so, it, it's so dysfunctional, right? With um, all the homeless situation and, and you cannot build with the NIMBY, you're not in my backyard and so on. It's, it, it's so problematic. Uh, so just having a, a, a new place where mm -hmm. uh, you can hang out, even if, even if it's temporary, even if it's a roaming village, even if around longevity conferences or crypto conferences, you can have a few weeks before and after of Airbnbs of amazing people just gathering and, and doing this stuff. And then uh, potentially longer pop-up cities, like a few months, uh, a few hundred people like Zuzalo, uh, like the one we're doing in, uh, in Prosper, right? End of October. Um, and then more and more so it's just eventually having some places that are permanent, some neighborhoods, some districts, and potentially also a jurisdiction that is truly a longevity city um, governed by its citizens with this moral innovation that we're going to do medicine in a, in a better way. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. It's a good segue to t let's talk a bit about what or to let's close with what support do we want to enlist for our plans right 
And I can start to be a bit more concrete. So we have several conferences coming up in Prospera all the way from September through until like mid-December, right? So the most relevant one for our purposes, probably November 17 to 19, Decentralized Science and Longevity, where we bring lots of our friends. A man called Greg Nakagawa is building a regenerative medicine hub and recruiting more biotech entrepreneurs, physicians, clinicians to come and set up clinics. So Prospera is definitely going to be a big hub for that. And then after into, into the new year right now is the tentative plan. Um, we want to enlist like at least 40 to 50 entrepreneurs in healthcare and biotech, um, potentially from the crypto side for financing and look at not only at Prospera, but branch out a bit into some other places in Latin America, to Uruguay, to Panama, to Costa Rica, to um, Belize potentially to look at their special economic zones and look to enlist local support there to build sort of more options, right? Sort of along the lines that we've been talking about, where we have some degrees of regulatory autonomy, where we can potentially piggyback off of existing clinical trial infrastructure or medical tourism, just to expand from, from where we are. Of course, what will also play a role is um, some of the jurisdictions like Montenegro that you're working with. Um, the biggest support that I would like to enlist is if you're an aspiring biotech or healthcare or existing entrepreneur, you have an existing company um, and you're attracted to what we're doing and want to help build to realize that that future where we build like a fountain of youth, a more decentralized longevity focused network union. I'll leave a couple of links in the description of this episode. Lawrence, onto you, what would you like to enlist support for or what are kind of, what are you projecting in the future? What do you want to give listeners on the way that they can engage with? First, I'd love people to, to meditate on um, this idea that everyone agrees to, to cure Alzheimer's, cancer, and so on. But when you talk about aging, they somehow get turned off and, and come up with all these uh, counter arguments, uh, you know, overpopulation, immortal dictators cultural stagnation, all of these things, and just meditate, really think about it because each one of these has, uh, uh, it, it doesn't really hold water when you, when you think about it and, and you realize that um, it's just a coping mechanism. Then um, just for people to kind of also meditate on, on this idea of, you know, uh, instead of trying to only lobby and, and use your voice in voting and so on to reform, also look at hedging and, and exiting. And so great analogy there is like, instead of trying to convince as an employee of IBM, instead of trying to convince IBM to change and make PCs, exit and make your Apple and Microsoft startups and so on. Uh, the same thing with, with governance and, and so on. Um, then um, to, to not dismiss crypto and, and this idea of, of communities, uh, bottom up sort of crowdfunding and, and coordinating to, to gather to places like the, the New Hampshire Free State Project and so on, uh, just where people wanted to move to a location. Uh, just we, I think we can implement way better um, coordination mechanisms for a lot of people to move to a new location and so on, uh, especially when they have a really good intrinsic motivation, not just libertarian, but rather in life and death and, and a really good um, mission, right? And around health and so on, like with, with, nobody can really disagree with. Uh, then for, um, for, I think women to also think about, uh, this idea of, uh, reproductive longevity and, and thinking, you know, if, if we didn't if, like, if you think about aging, uh, it being not a disease, also the uh, being pregnant, pregnant wasn't a disease and contraceptives contraceptives couldn't have been. Uh, taken through the FDA, they had to be taken in in the, uh, other like uh, smaller countries, tested there, and then only then uh, in the 1930s or 40s, women in the U.S. had to lobby the FDA to allow pills that weren't really targeting a disease, like the contraceptive pill. And so, how many more other things are we missing from from there? And really, I think looking at how many uh, places in in your life uh, you could benefit from amazing things that you haven't even thought about, uh, how, how much your life could improve and uh, how much progress is held back um, and how, much, how amazing it would be if you would be surrounded by um, like-minded people 
um, not as like an echo chamber, right? And, and not everyone agreeing on everything. Uh, I think uh, diversity of thought, but uh, having agreement about one um, one moral innovation, one commandment, and, and then being able to to be around those people. So one one thing would be the longevitystate.com a conference. Um, it it will be the Longevity State Congress in Rhode Island on August seven, I think. I think he said he wants to postpone it. Okay, to maybe September or something um, like that. Yeah, so Adam, Adam, and Nathan are, are doing this uh, with Vitalism and I, IO, and, and so also, um, yeah, we'll see about that. Uh, a bunch of longevity conferences, like ending age related diseases, the DSI and longevity on August ten in New York. Um, then, I think yeah, the October thirtieth Prospera gathering. If you would come there. Uh, of course, meanwhile, I think the best way is to go to vita.com and, and join the Discord and talk in the Vita States channel. Or, you know, if you're interested in alternative uh, ways of funding things, you know, the Longevity Prize channel or, you know, biohacking or whatever you're interested in. And, you know, the, just the Longevity Lounge or the general chat and, and just start ch chatting about all of this. I think that is the community where. I like to hang out most and of course I'm biased, but I think all of these things are kind of um, converging in, uh, in this big community that's online, can do a lot of stuff, has a shared bank account, is experimenting in real life as well. And uh, yeah, you can buy tokens if you want to contribute funds, basically. You can uh, do work and, and so contribute your your skills and earn tokens and, and, and vote with them. Um, if you're a researcher or no researcher, you know, tell us about a project. If you have connections with uh, governments, your of officials, right, uh, connect us with them. Um, yeah. Fantastic, Lawrence. That was really great um, to finally introduce you to my listeners, many of which might already know you. But to hear your personal story of how you got into longevity and how it could improve your life and the life of many millions of people around the world that are left behind by the current medical system and its problem. And we talked about how much potential the science is already offering that's left on the table because we have a flawed regulatory paradigm, because it's designed around the wrong moral premises. And I hope it could rally our listeners around the work that you and I are doing with our various initiatives, many of which we do together. Or I'm involved in some of your initiatives, you're involved in some in mine. And as it's either as encouragement to, to support us on that mission. It's a very big mission. And Lawrence, you're one of the most important um, influencers and doers and executor, funder and thinker in the space. So it was my great honor to have you on the show and to spend lots of time with you in Montenegro during Zuzalu and hopefully more together in the future, wherever our nomadic tribes gather. So thank you so much for coming on, Lawrence. Thank you. I'm super excited.